Welcome students to our Economics of Innovation course. Uh, we are already in a third semester in this pandemic uh, and unfortunately we have to get uh, used to it. Uh, but there are even some advantages uh, because uh, given that it takes so long uh, there and as you might have noticed from uh, Economics to Go, our YouTube channel, a first set of lectures for this course already exists. And the question is then, how should we, or how should I teach, given this asset, given these videos are available, uh, I thought that it would be boring for me and also for you uh, to produce pretty much the same kind of videos once more. Uh, you would see two almost identical set of videos and probably that's not so interesting. Uh, what is uh, highly en vogue, what is heavily discussed is what is called an inverted classroom or a flip classroom. There I typically would just say watch the videos uh, up front, uh, then prepare questions and we discuss them at some time in class. And we will have a di great discussion and you'll learn a lot. Uh, the problem is, as Goethe wrote uh, already some 200 years ago, die Botschaft höre ich wohl allein uh, mir fehlt der Glauben. I hear the message well, but lack faith's constant trust. Uh, we and you in particular, you have best intentions, but we are human after all. What does this mean? Uh, behavioral economics has shown that people often do not act fully rational and fully consistent, and uh, they make plans, but uh, do not uh, act them accordingly. There are very nice papers, uh, just like, like uh, the one I have here, Paying not to the gym, uh, paying not to go to the gym from Stefano della Vigna and Ulrike Malmendier, published very uh, well in the American uh, Economic Review already some uh, 15 years ago. And what they found out is that people have the best intentions. They buy a subscription uh, to the gym, uh, to a fitness studio, uh, and then they make the best uh, uh, New Year's resolution, as you see here from Bridget Jones' uh, diary, hopefully you can see it as, as here. Uh, they say, I will go each week uh, to the gym, but then they didn't go at all. Okay, And what we also do is, and what is another uh, important uh, line of research in behavioral economics is, we procrastinate. Uh, procrastination means Aufschieberitis in, in German, so we make uh, some some very good uh, we we make some very good uh, or have good good oh, what is vorsätze so we have New Year's resolutions or something like that uh, but then uh, we do not manage to act accordingly now how would then our concept of the inverted classroom uh, looking uh, like if we take into account there might be problems with self discipline and with staying commitment and uh, even more, uh, even if you are self-disciplined and if you stay committed, uh, probably it's rather boring for you or not very, very nice if you have to watch these videos alone. Okay, uh, first of all, it's alone and you would have to uh, to organize a lot if you want to do that in groups. Uh, that would not be very satisfying after all if you have to watch it alone and. Uh, the other point is uh, you watch it and then you have the questions and then you have the questions but you have to wait for another one or two or three days until you can ask the question. So uh, what I thought might be a good idea is that we watch the, uh, the, the videos together. Uh, this gives you the opportunity to ask questions right away. It is easier for me to take the questions you have directly and I can also comment on my own video. Uh, many people make a living on YouTube or Twitch by having other people watching how they play games or, or whatever they do or how they watch TV series and comment on that. Even though it w definitely will be not so much fun, uh, at least you can watch me looking at my own videos and uh, you see how uh, I react to my own R's and U's and whatever it is and my misnomers and so on. Uh, and of course, we also have uh, have solved this coordination problem. It just you just meet we just all meet at at the time uh, which is in a stud IP for for the lecture. Okay, uh, yeah. So I think this is pretty much what I wanted to say. 
you can always ask questions in WebEx. You can either do that by really asking or by putting a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, what we will see is uh, most on, most of these questions I will likely answer in in the YouTube stream because I, I uh, guess that they are of general of some general interest. If they are not, I just uh, answer that in private in, in, in WebEx. Okay, we just see how it works. This is just an experiment. We might need to make the best out of the situation. And of course, this is economics of innovation. We should be innovative. And uh, I'm happy to change uh, this system if it doesn't work, but I'm just uh, uh, curious uh, how you think it works. Uh, Anyway, you can watch uh, how I try to deal with some technical problems in the old videos. You will see, for instance, that sound and video once in a while are not in sync. And then I just uh, show you the, 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 the slide directly and, and you hopefully get the, uh, uh, the, the video and the audio in sync. Uh, typically, uh, you see I'm Bavarian and I have to speak English and I don't do that uh, very quickly. Uh, so what you see is that uh, the, 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 the videos are such that it's probably easy for you uh, to follow them if the speed is at 125 at 125%. So what I will do is I will typically run them at 125. If this is too fast or if, it, or if I sh should speed up, just tell me in WebEx. What I also will do is I will uh, show you the subtitle, the closed captioning. Uh, it's perhaps easier to follow and I can clarify the words, the Google algorithm, uh, which produces a subtitle, didn't understand. So I'm always rather proud that um, my Bavarian English uh, is understood to 90 to 95 percent by Google. But uh, there are, of course, some problems. Uh, uh, my TH is ob obviously not, not the best. Yeah, I already told you in WebEx that uh, it would be good uh, for you if you uh, use headphones. Otherwise, we might hear both what you say and what is on YouTube. If there are any technical problems with my sound or with, or with the stream, just tell me. It's an experiment, as I told you. Uh, what I also told you already is and uh, what you saw in the very beginning. Uh, it was this QR code for, for class X. I will run several uh, class X surveys and experiments later on in the course. Uh, and uh, we might also have MobLab uh, experiments. It's just another provider of uh, game theoretic experiments and so on. I just start with, uh, with, with the video streaming that and then you will see uh, how I intended that. So economics of innovation, this is the title of our course. We could also call it economics of technological change or economics of research and development. Uh, and uh, here is an overview of the course. Uh, what I want to do uh, right now is just to give you uh, a brief introduction and, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, also show you some organ or, or mention some organizational details and uh, administrative questions so how you get uh, your grade and so on uh, that's uh, what what i want to do right now uh, here is an overview of the course i only will tell you that at the end of today's lecture what we are in detail we look at certain dif uh, different models. We look into patents, into licensing. We look into adoption, diffusion of new technology. Uh, there will also be uh, uh, a part on two-sided markets and we will discuss innovation and antitrust policy. And at the end, uh, there will be some case studies which seem in times of uh, Corona uh, rather uh, important, namely uh, pharmaceutical innovation. How do we uh, trigger pharmaceutical innovation? Uh, innovation? How do we give incentives? How uh, does uh, uh, pharmaceutical innovation work? And so on. Uh, okay, so if we move on with economics of innovation, we have to start with Josef Ole Schumpeter. Josef Ole Schumpeter uh, was born, uh, was an Austrian, born in 1883, and he's in a sense the uh, grandfather or the, the founder of all these studies on uh, or of most studies of uh, uh, research and development of technical progress 
and so on. Uh, and what I want to give you here is a, a rather long quote from his rather famous book, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, uh, which he wrote when he was a professor at Harvard. Uh, at Harvard. And uh, this, this quote starts with, economists are at uh, long last emerging from the stage in which price competition was all they saw. So that's where he describes perfect competition. That's where we have price competition. Then he moves on to say, uh, as soon as, as quality competition and sales effort are admitted into the sacred precincts of theory, the price variable is ousted from its dominant position. However, it is still competition within a rigid pattern of invariant conditions, methods of production and forms of industrial organization in particular, which monopolizes attention. What he describes here is more or less traditional I would say traditional industrial organization. That's a topic I uh, discuss in the course uh, industrial, or these are the topics I discuss at some length in the course uh, industrial organization, which I will again uh, offer in, in the winter term and offered in the previous winter terms, where we discussed uh, things like quality competition and vertical product differentiation. And we also discussed sales offer that effort that was that was uh, uh, the, the part on advertising. OK, uh, but the point is uh, Schumpeter moves on and says that in capitalist reality, as distinguished from its textbook picture, picture it is not that kind of competition which counts, but the competition from the new uh, from the new uh, commodity, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization. Competition which commands a decisive cost or quality advantage and which strikes not at the margins of the profits, but at their foundations and their very lives. He described that as a process of creative destruction coming from these new commodities, new technologies, and which uh, really might uh, destroy companies, okay? Not just uh, eating into the margins, but destroy uh, companies. And he moves on uh, that uh, to, uh, to an evaluation of this kind of competition. He says this kind of competition is as much more effective than the other as a bombardment is in comparison with forcing a door. And so much more important that it becomes a matter of comparative indifference whether a competition in the ordinary sense functions more or less promptly. The powerful lever that in the long run expands output and brings down prices is in any case made of other stuff. So what he does here is uh, he looks at the trade-off between what we might uh, in modern terms call the trade-off between static and dynamic efficiency. You hopefully know all from your uh, undergraduate studies that we get a welfare loss or a dead weight loss once we have a monopoly, for instance. What he says that these triangles uh, we get here are typically, these would be static welfare losses, are typically not so important if we have dynamic efficiency, if we have competition, as I uh, had on the last page, in terms of the new commodity, in terms of the new process, and so on. This is his evaluation of R&D competition from uh, a social point. Uh, of view. And here uh, is what uh, uh, we mean by creative destruction. And uh, actually, uh, we have one company uh, which really uh, gave the best example of creative destruction you can imagine of. Uh, do you know what started in, in uh, early 2007? Actually, uh, the Apple iPhone uh, was uh, brought to the market. And you see what happens. Here you see what happens, Apple destroyed, and that's what you can read in the notes. Uh, also to the slides I distributed, it destroyed several companies. Uh, unfortunately, it also destroyed uh, Nokia. I always was fond of my Nokia phones. But uh, you see what happened to the, uh, to the uh, uh, stock market value of Nokia. It went down by more than 50%. Perhaps some of you know what uh, Research in Motion is. Research in Motion is the company which uh, which produced a BlackBerry. Uh, do you know what happened to BlackBerry? Well, there is no longer any BlackBerry. Okay, uh, Sony also had trouble. There are other companies who did better, like uh, Google and Microsoft, as they were not direct competitors. But in the notes, you see there is a. a I mention uh, an article from 2011, uh, and and this author uh, mentions as destroyed Hewlett and Packard. Uh, excuse me, I, I just wanted to stay here. Hewlett and Packard. Uh, uh, Dell and so on, Motorola actually. Okay, so what you see here, we really saw that uh, 
in this sense, product innovation destroyed several other companies. It not only changed the profit of Nokia uh, uh, slightly, uh, Nokia is no longer a producer of, of mobile phones. Okay. Uh, here you see another example uh, taken from a paper by Christian Bruder and, and uh, David Weinstein. Uh, they look into the product entry and exit rate in the United States. And how do, you, do they measure that? Yeah, you know all these uh, barcodes on, the, uh, on, on new products. And these barcodes are uh, unique. And they looked into how many new barcodes do we get in a certain amount of time. These are these uh, unique or universal product codes, UPCs here. And you see that the entry rate over one year is 25% here. This is this one year median you, you have here. And what you see is that really 25% of all barcodes are new. The question is how new are these products? But anyway, they are different. Okay, uh, there are at least slight changes, and you see over a nine-year period, yeah, uh, 87, 78% uh, of all uh, products change, and we have similar exit rates. Okay, many old products are are uh, leaving the market, and you see in terms here what what creation and destruction means is that uh, what is uh, the value share. And you see that the value share of the creation of the new products, they after nine years, they make up for 64% uh, of, of the revenue and, and destruction is 37%. So the point here is you see a lot of product creation and destruction, that is a lot of uh, uh, research and development of technical progress is also going on for the standard product you buy uh, in supermarkets and so on. Yeah, and here uh, the, the, the uh, I just summed up a few or, or the, probably the most important research questions we are going to address in the course. The first one, also going back to Schumpeter, is who invests in R&D? Who are the drivers of innovation? Are these new entrepreneurial firms, might also uh, speak of small startup firms, or are these the large established corporations like the Googles, like the Apples, uh, like, like the IBMs, or like other large companies? Uh, these two strands, uh, are both related to Schumpeter. It's, they are called Schumpeter Mark I and Schumpeter Mark II. Uh, in 2011, in his book, uh, Theorie der Wirtschaftlichen Entwicklung, which was still published in German in English, Theory of Economic Development, Schumpeter thought that the single entrepreneur, really a, a tinkerer and a, a one guy who came up with a very good idea, a very new idea, was the driver of innovation. In 1943, he thought more of the large company running large research laboratories uh, that they are uh, the the drivers of innovation. Uh, actually, uh, it, it's not so clear uh, in, in, in terms, I will give you some, some uh, empirics, uh, how, uh, for instance, R&D expenditure relates to firm size. It, it's not so clear. Uh, the the, 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 the uh, relation seems to be more, uh, in a sense, more linear, so that uh, all uh, have a similar sh uh, uh, share of R&D expenditure even though large companies seem to invest more in R&D. Yeah, then the second question, is, which is even more interesting or important from, from a point of view of, of economics, is uh, which market structure is most conduct, uh, conducive to R&D? Uh, is it better to have something like perfect competition to have a lot of innovation, or is it better to have monopolies? And uh, therefore, is market power a prerequisite for innovation? Uh, Schumpeter is more uh, related to the second point of view, uh, to this uh, importance of market power, because uh, what he says, you need to have some monopoly power, or at least you need to have the chance to win a monopoly in order to be motivated to invest in R&D. Whereas Eros uh, said that, uh, and we will present or see that uh, that uh, model of Eros in, in the next uh, lecture in, in detail, uh, that, that it's more... Uh, uh, that it's perfect that competition is better for 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 innovation actually as i state in a note uh, and and a quote from a recent paper by daniel spalber published in the journal of political economy is uh, that it's not so clear that, that it's still not decided so spalber says that economists have long considered the effects of competitive pre competitive pressures on incentives to innovate and he distinguishes between schumpeter and Arab, what i just told you uh, the, the point is, however, that uh, as he mentions uh, a study by Sidak and Thies from, from, from 2009, uh, who state that despite 50 years of research, economists do not appear to have found much evidence that market concentration has a statistical significant impact on, on innovation. So, uh, and, and Sutton goes on to say there appears to be no consensus as to the form of relationship uh, if any, between R&D intensity and concentration, where concentration would be a, a measure of market power. So it's really rather complicated here. 
uh, and it's not so so clear what uh, this relation is and that's uh, therefore it's more important uh, to get it at least theoretical in, in the right way to to model this uh, relation uh, finally, of course, if, as economists, we are always interested uh, in the question whether the level of R&D activities is optimal from a, a perspective of the society as a whole. So do firms spend too much uh, on R&D compared to a social optimum or do they spend uh, insufficiently uh, compared to a, 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 a social optimum? Of course, if you think of vaccines for, for, for Corona, uh, you might think that it would have been better if they invested much more uh, earlier. OK, uh, for, for related, uh, because we know there are many uh, variants of the coronavirus, uh, so perhaps it would have been better to spend more. Uh, so the, the trade off here is, of course, uh, that what I, what I state here in terms of duplication of, of efforts and spillovers. Uh, currently, we probably wouldn't uh, be afraid much that uh, it's not a problem if we have two vaccines uh, for, for the coronavirus. So a duplication of efforts uh, would, wouldn't look like a, 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 uh, large waste, uh, but if you think of, uh, say, electric cars, do you think that it's optimal from a from a society viewpoint that, say, all German car manufacturers spend a lot to develop an electric car, and they uh, uh, all of them invent pretty much or, or develop pretty much the same things? Okay, so it's not so clear whether that's optimal from a from a viewpoint of society, from a viewpoint of of social surplus and of total welfare, and we will look into that. On the other hand, of course, there are spillovers. That is, you one one firm or one type of agent might learn from uh, the research others do. So the most obvious thing is, of course, if you invent a wheel and the wheel, nobody knows how a wheel works. All others who see that uh, a wheel does a wonderful job will uh, replace the. Uh, how is it that like more like uh, they're the, the quadratic or rectangular? You couldn't call them a wheel uh, from their cards, but of course that wouldn't work. Okay, uh, so that that's the most obvious thing. And of course you might have spillovers in much more important views that some uh, uh, drugs like uh, currently I think it's called remdesivir, a drug which was developed to be used in 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 uh, HIV. Uh, and, and AIDS uh, treatment uh, might also be be, be uh, useful and help uh, in terms of treating the corona or, or uh, COVID-19. And of course, that would be a very good uh, uh, spillover. OK, and final, the final question is always, what is the effect on, of R&D on, on aggregate long run growth? How important is, uh, is, is uh, R&D for per capita income? We will briefly mention that at the end uh, of, of the course. Uh, I Oh, uh, and f because I have this nice picture right here, I want to say a, a sentence on that. Uh, there is a huge discussion about whether we run, or whether humankind, whether researchers run out of ideas. Uh, actually, there's a famous quote from, I think it was the chair of the US Patent Office in, say, 1890 and something, uh, saying that uh, everything which uh, could sensibly be uh, developed and invented is invented almost that was more than 100 years ago okay uh, but there's still a, uh, a deep, huge debate whether uh, innovation might be slowing down uh, here uh, I, I gave you the in the notes uh, an article by the economist uh, which discusses it uh, uh, there is also a recent academic paper by uh, Nicholas Bloom uh, Charles uh, Jones and, and, and co-authors, and they uh, address the question whether are ideas getting harder to find? As we develop so much, and for instance, if you think in terms of microprocessors or semiconductors, it might always get more difficult to put more transistors on a single uh, microprocessor. So uh, does it always get more complicated and then therefore will we get a uh, 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 slower technical at once, okay? Before I move on here uh, to, to give you some uh, facts about R&D expenditures, about R&D practices in different countries and so on, I will uh, move back uh, or, or I will just have a small feedback break. Okay, uh, before I move on here, the next part will be one where I speak or I spoke about uh, the STUD IP, about the kind of information uh, we provide uh, in the intranet. Uh, actually, what you will see it's, uh, it's exactly the same up to just that uh, the times are slightly different. Uh, the tutorial class on, on Tuesday uh, will be from 12 to 2, and last year it was from 4 to, 4 to 6 or something like that. Apart from that, everything is identical, so uh, the, the schedule and so on. So that's why I just move uh, back. And it's also uh, the, 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 the last thing I want to show you 
the what is also identical is uh, the the assignment which we have in this year and of course you can find that already in uh, the the stud ip in the download session okay so uh, i move on uh, with 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 the video and uh, all the uh, administrative things uh, which i explained to you there uh, which explained last year are relevant this year as well to our lecture i want now to discuss before i move on giving you some data on on uh, uh, the r d process on r d expenditure and so on i want to just give you some overview of the course okay what, what does it mean uh, i will uh, address some questions concerning uh, course administration and and uh, course organization in particular how you come up or how you get how you earn your credits as you see and as you uh, obviously managed is uh, that all of the important information on the course is uh, in our intra JLU, JLU uh, intranet uh, stud ip and what you see here uh, is uh, the, the course page in the in the internet uh, and what you see here is you get the information uh, what is also important what you get here and what you already saw is uh, the the course description that's what i already gave you uh, the the important thing here is that uh, it also has some some uh, references here for instance uh, bill bormol's book the free market innovation machine uh, provides a very nice introductory chapter uh, which you can read and i also have in terms of business administration students i have something from mit sloan management uh, review top 10 lessons on a new business on information here i also gave you further uh, literature the the point here is that uh, there is no textbook for this course so i use many different sources uh, for the book and uh, in particular these are once in a while textbook like the one from pebble richard norman uh, people uh, who took the IO course in the winter term will uh, recognize or remember it. It's an industrial organization. I also have several uh, parts from uh, Jean Thierry's theory of industrial organization uh, and also parts from Paul Stoneman's handbook on the economics of innovation. And there's also another handbook. Uh, I will always give you uh, some specific references to the specific chapters and also, and we will get to back to that in, in a minute uh, in, in the assignments where we have problems we will give you specific references so that you it's easier for you to solve uh, the, the problems so and as you see the course will be held in english what we also have here uh, i have the, the german version of the stud ip you will have the english one perhaps and then the uplaf plan probably means schedule or something like that here you see a tentative or preliminary schedule of the course today it starts with the introduction on thursday i will move on with uh, with with the basic models and the overview of imperfect information then we will have an assignment uh, uh, the typically that's what you saw in the very beginning uh, we have uh, both lectures and tutorial classes uh, maximilian geil who is also on, on webex uh, and you will be able to see him probably at the end of the lecture uh, he will give uh, the tutorial class on on tuesday and i always will give the lecture which typically uh, takes place on on thursdays there might be small changes because there will be two uh, holidays uh, which are thursdays in a, in a summer term so and here what you see is just the different topics as we uh, as we will uh, touch them and at, in the very end we will have these case studies or a uh, course uh, okay uh, and then uh, all the the important files for the course are here in, in the in the folder the time or in english files you see there's assignment where you see uh where you get uh, the, the the pdfs with the problem sets and here's a lecture slides where you can download the select like the, the slides uh under or which i i present uh, at the end of the of the the lecture i always also in webex will discuss uh We'll discuss uh, Microsoft Teams because most of this information will always also be available in Teams, and uh, uh, in particular, we will do uh, the tutorial class on on Teams. Uh, uh, so the point is, I already gave you the course for Microsoft Teams. We will also discuss that at the end uh, of uh, of the lecture or or slightly after the lecture in in Webex how uh, that works, and uh, we'll then. Uh, 
you know, give you some indication of, of what to do. Uh, the important thing which you should do anyway, uh, and uh, what you see here in the overview, is you should get the code for Microsoft Teams so that you, the, for the Economics of Innovation team, so that you uh, get the important information there and also access to uh, the course uh, notebook in, in OneNote. Okay, that was. Uh, I just have to be look now for the assignment. That was the stood IP. Uh, now, uh, here, uh, this is uh, assignment one. Uh, hopefully, all of you downloaded assignment one. You'll see uh, in the very beginning, it just gives the overview, which we had. It also gives, in, in a slightly more detailed way, the literature, literature we had. Uh, and you see the tutorial class is on, on Tuesdays. Of course, it's not in... in uh, Hörsaal 45 in room, lecture hall 45, but it will be uh, on WebEx or on Microsoft Teams. Uh, and here uh, the lecture is, of course, also digital. The important thing now is what are the course requirements so that you earn credits uh, for uh, the course. And uh, we, we will have to discuss that because uh, a small part will also be the case studies part where you should uh, where you should present that. And uh, as we didn't know how well it works, uh, it was unclear about this 5%, but 80, 95% uh, of uh, what uh, contributes to final, your final mark is clear at the moment. There will be a final exam, which uh, will make up 80 or 85% of the total mark. Then there is participation in the exercise class, uh, which will be 15 to, to, to 20%. Uh, so the first thing is that you should, hand, should prepare and hand in assignments. Uh, there will be actually a total. So you you already this is already assignment one, and what you see here is uh, uh, these are just the kind of problems you have to discuss. They are very often, in a sense, mathematical problems where you also should provide economic uh, uh, interpretations. Once in a while, they are also uh, problems to be uh, discussed verbally. And uh, these assignments uh, you should prepare each week. Here you see date due is twenty uh, eighth, so next week, next uh, Tuesday. Actually, it's always Monday uh, evening, and. Uh, in order to prepare that, you should form working groups of, say, three to five students. So we don't want that every one of you does this uh, on his or her own, but uh, join working groups. And we do not expect you to provide perfect uh, solutions. So we just want to uh, see that you really tried and tried hard uh, to come up with solutions. Uh, we don't expect that you have perfect solutions. Otherwise, we, it wouldn't be necessary to have a tutorial class. OK, uh, so here, just prepare it. Don't use uh, the, the solutions from last year. Uh, they might be wrong anyway, because we change uh, the numbers once in a while. OK, uh, and yeah, uh, that's uh, that's that's about it uh, here. So you should uh, submit uh, these assignments. Uh, at the end, I will show you that this might even be possible in Microsoft Teams. Uh, for the beginning, you should, in any case, also submit them uh, via via email here uh, to the following to the assignments. Uh, vwl one uh, homepage with a specific uh, subject because we have uh, several folders and we receive many different emails on that account. So you should use the right account so that we uh, correctly. Uh, uh, assign that uh, uh, to to the right uh, problem set. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so this is the assignments. And uh, the next thing would then be participation and presentation. So the, the idea is, and uh, Maximilian Geil will tell you more about that, uh, that uh, you not only hand that in, but also present and discuss these solutions, at least partially uh, in class. And if you do that, you will earn uh, you will earn pr uh, also cr you also can earn credits and this will be five uh, up to five percent and finally which what we have still to discuss but if it works i really would uh, like to have it uh, is this case studies part where we would just look go into the details how does uh, uh, research and development work in the pharmaceutical sector as you will see in a few minutes the pharmaceutical sector is uh, in terms of, of uh, research and development one of the most important and as you see in terms of the corona crisis it's also very important for our health and well-being so it's important how that uh, uh, works and we have several uh, shorter papers which uh, also these working groups for three or five paper people should uh, give a small uh, a short overview and, and give say five or ten minutes presentation on uh, say the the stages of the r d process or the the different phases of these uh, the clinical phases and so on of the of the uh, r d process for for medical drugs uh, that would it be for the moment. Uh, I would uh, 
shortly make a, or make a short break here and ask if there are any questions. The problem is, of course, the delay, but I will make a short break uh, here anyway and ask for whether uh, that is clear. Okay, questions. Okay, after we have discussed the organizational and administrative questions uh, on how to uh, to obtain the credits for the course, I will go. I want to go back uh, to really a huge number uh, of tables, just to give you an impression on the importance uh, of of research and development and innovation, and on how much different countries span around here. How that might explain uh, different performances of these countries, and so on. So first of all, I just want to give you some aggregate uh, figure on on R and D. Uh, what you see here uh, is. Uh, the R&D expenditure uh, divided by GDP. So Germany has a, has a 2.5 billion GDP or so. And if you see that here in Germany, uh, the, the R&D expenditure or say 2.5%, okay, so would be, uh, oh God. Anyway, we saw that it's about 70 billion uh, euros, okay. What, what you see here is, and uh, you see that this is quite an outdated slide. It, it ends in 2007. The point is that uh, I use this slide because we used to have Russian exchange students and you see what happened to Russian uh, uh, R&D expenditure. And uh, it, it really fell down after 1989 and now it's uh, at a rather low level. You see Japan has a rather high investment in R&D as has South Korea. Uh, you see in the United States, and that's why uh, this slide is interesting, uh, United States has a very high share of defense related R&D. Uh, okay, they spend a lot on their army and, and on, on, on weapons and so on. So about a half a percentage point of their 2.5 percentage points uh, expenditure goes uh, onto, uh, onto uh, military uh, R&D. Uh, what you see here, uh, going to 2006, what is interesting here is that you both have the European Union here, the average, and you see China. And what you see here is that China is really uh, catching up. Uh, they are not just imitating, they are just innovating a lot, and in particular, uh, their uh, uh, success by companies like yeah, Huawei uh, is uh, really due to the fact that we spend a lot on R&D, and they already spend as much in China uh, in terms of GDP as the European Union average. United States has slightly more, Japan has even more, and here South Korea is particularly Samsung and so on, and you see they really invest a lot in R&D. Uh, here uh, it's the same in, in, in absolute terms, and here you see in absolute terms China already uh, is, is number two. Okay. Uh, here is a more detailed account of the R&D intensity in uh, mostly European countries, but also some others. This is uh, a bit old, but uh, it, I used it because uh, it, it gives uh, uh, you a comparison. Because, for instance, in, in, in 2006 in Germany, we spent about 2.5%. And in the next slide, you will see uh, we have much more. Later on, you will see that actually the goal, uh, there's a political goal that we should spend 3% of GDP on R&D. So what you see here is that... Uh, what you probably have known is if you look into the startup uh, culture you have in Israel, Israel spends a lot of, of R&D. Sweden also, so the Nordic countries, Finland used to spend a lot. Uh, that means that Nokia used to spend a lot on, on R&D. And here you see uh, some other countries like Portugal, uh, like Italy, who only spend a little on R&D. Uh, and uh, Greece and uh, perhaps it's not a coincidence that uh, the countries uh, which are better off have higher R&D expenditure. Of course, the problem is, as always, a correlation is not causality, and we do not know, and or it's, it's hard to, to find out whether countries grow faster or are richer because they spend more on R&D, or they spend more on R&D because they are richer and therefore can afford to spend more on R&D. So uh, anyway, so this is, uh, of course, an important task for, for, for uh, uh, empirical research. I will later on come back to uh, this question and, and show that there's at least some indication that a country's state three party uh, uh, grow faster if they spend more on R&D. Here you have the same slide, just uh, more updated. Typically, uh, these R&D uh, figures are more uh, or, or not, not so, so actually not, not so recent, not so up to date, uh, because it takes longer. You get that from uh, say some some tax figures and so on. But what you see here, Germany, that's what I wanted to show you, is already increased from 2006 uh, to 2009 by almost half a percentage point. So you see Germany tries to increase its R&D expenditure. Of course, the question is, is that due to political uh, initiatives or is it just the companies who, who learned that uh, it's very important to spend 
more uh, on, on R&D. Again, you see the US. US is uh, not really flat, but it, it's not so dynamic, uh, I, I would say. Yeah, uh, I think that's, that's it for the moment. Uh, on average in the Euro 28, it's, it's slightly increasing, but the increase is, is uh, or the growth uh, is, is rather slow here. Uh, next figure also slightly outdated, uh, but uh, I used it because we have here, uh, it's always hard to get uh, the different breakdowns uh, also uh, with, with the right kind of countries. Here you see who pays for R&D. So who funds R&D? So this would be the funds. Is it uh, the business? Okay, all these enterprises? Is it the government? Is it other sources? Or is it, for instance, foreign headquarters? And what you see here is, and that's really interesting to compare Greece and Germany. Oh, sorry, I should highlight, but that doesn't work better. In Germany, uh, uh, this R&D expenditure is for 66% funded by, by business. So two thirds are paid for for these R&D expenditures by, by companies, whereas in Greece it's only one quarter, and in Greece half of, of, of uh, oh, I have to erase it here, half of the funding comes from the government, whereas in Germany it's less one, than one third. In the US you have a similar pattern, also two thirds from, from, uh, from, from companies, in, in Japan it's even higher. Okay, uh, so here is, uh, this is somehow also gives you an indication, and you have other countries, for instance like Austria, where obviously foreign companies, they have many, for instance Siemens has subsidiaries there, you have many foreign countries who do research in Austria, like BMW uh, produces engines in Austria, and Malta also have some development uh, facilities or R&D facilities. So here you see who is funding R&D, and it might also be important that uh, not only the government funds it, but business itself uh, recognizes uh, the necessity to to fund R&D. Uh, and here you see a uh, 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 split according to first the funding and second the performance. You saw that the government uh, funds a lot, for instance, in, in Greece. It also funds uh, something uh, in, for instance, in the United States, but it doesn't do that much business it, it, or uh, it doesn't perform R&D itself. It, uh, even though it, the government runs R&D facilities and R&D laboratories, it mostly subsidizes and as you see here business because uh, uh, the expenditure of the business uh, or, or the, the performance uh, is 68%, whereas funding is only 58% in the US. Okay, And what you see here is we are at universities do also a lot of, of uh, uh, R&D, okay? uh, but uh, we are funded typically by governments and not by our own funds. Okay, That's what you also see. Uh, now, another breakdown, okay, I, I apologize for having so many uh, slides, but I think they are just very important and hopefully also uh, also uh, interesting. Uh, also interesting. Uh, this is a breakdown according to the character of work, and we di divide. And I will give you a more formal uh, 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 definition below into uh, R and D uh, research and development in basic research, in applied research and development. Basic research is like what astronomers do. It's like what is, how is it called? Particle accelerators, Teilchenbeschleuniger do, okay? Where you never know whether you get any commercial value out of that. It's just, you want to know something how the world uh, works. Applied research is already closer to, to, to uh, commercialization and development is really very close uh, to, to the final product. And what is interesting here, of course, about 20% of, of funding of R&D goes into, at least that's the data for the US, goes into basic research, about 20% also in applied, uh, applied research, about 60% into development. And what you see here is in particular basic research, who funds basic research, and for it's no, co uh, no, no surprise for you that it's mainly the federal government. Uh, who, who funds basic research. Business only has a small part of funding, also universities fund something. And here you see the performing sector, it's mostly done at universities, this kind of basic research. Okay, again, hopefully uh, some, some interesting information. Here you also see uh, about the same kind of, of breakdown. Uh, you see here basic research, you have more like the universities, whereas in, in development uh, in the US, you only have uh, funding by the federal government by some research subsidies and industry versus in performing sector, this is just another breakdown, uh, you have in basic research, basically this, this uh, red column, which are the universities, whereas in development, it's largely done by uh, the business sector, by the industry. Uh, here, uh, some parts also for Germany, it's pretty much the same thing. Here is again the funding, uh, and I think I, I should go or I should move on to the next slide, which is even nicer here, a slide from the uh, BMBF, the German Ministry uh, of, of Education and, and, 
and science, Bildung und Forschung. And here you again have the funding sector and the performing sector. Okay, you see uh, the, the the business industry funds about 54 billion. Uh, it gets uh, some funding for its performance here. It, uh, It, it, it spends, in a sense, it pays uh, 45 billion, but it spends uh, 61 billion. And so it receives part uh, from the government and part also from foreign uh, companies, uh, typically. Okay, and similar here, you see how much universities spend on R&D, 15 billion, and this is pretty much paid for uh, by, by the government. Okay, and here you see in, in 2015, 15, we were already at, at, at almost 89 billion euros in terms of spending on R&D. Uh, here you see uh, all pay, all spending on not only on on R and D, R and D would be here, research and development, but uh, what we spend on education, which would be this, which is typically primary and secondary uh, education. So primary school uh, in Germany we call it gymnasium, then the second secondary school and so on, and we spend seven percent on GDP on that. So this is uh, quite a large uh, chunk. So and and 2.8 percent was in 2010 spent on on R and D about 10 percent on this whole uh, yeah this is somehow like like spending on human capital and also on uh, research and development uh, same thing here this is just uh, the overview of how that changed over time and in particular how much is done on universities it was in 2011 it was 13 billion uh, I just put that up here because I wanted to compare this uh, with Uh, the next slide, this is the spending on the EEG umlage, the German uh, renewable energy uh, law. Uh, so you see here, uh, last year we spent, or two years ago, we spent almost 25 billion, uh, which is twice as much as what we spend on universities for funding of solar panels. Whether this is, uh, whether this is really uh, efficient uh, or a good thing or uh, helps to, to fight climate change, Uh, is actually a topic we will address in the seminar we have uh, this year, where we will be asked or address the question how economists uh, would uh, uh, tackle climate change and which kind of instruments. And uh, at least my personal view is that we do not spend uh, this uh, kind of money very wisely at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I spent a long time with the University of Vienna, did my habilitation there, and Austria is an interesting country. Why is Austria an interesting country? Because you see here, and you will see that uh, in more detail later, uh, in particular here, if you lose uh, on the next slide, if you look into 1981, uh, uh, so, the, so the, green, the green line is uh, Austria. Okay, you see here in Austria, uh, they spend only very little, only 1% of GDP uh, on R&D, whereas Germany, so this is, uh, Germany is, is, is this, oh, how can I? So is this uh, uh, red uh, line? Germany already was there, 2.5 percent, uh, and uh, re uh, Austria really uh, started with a, with a R&D and a technology policy uh, aimed at increasing R&D in the economy. So they, they gave tax credits and so on, and, and at least in, in terms of this output measure, they were quite successful because they are almost at at three percent in, excuse me, <coughs> in terms of GDP. And here you see how that breaks down. In Austria, uh, you see that uh, here, even though the Bund, the government, and the Bundesländer, the, the federal uh, states, are important, uh, the, the Unternehmen sector, that is industry, spends the most. So here, uh, it was success, uh, quite successful, and you will see later on, a politician set a, a goal in 2000 of reaching a 3% in terms of GDP, and, <coughs> excuse me, And Austria reached that goal almost. Okay. Oh, what's wrong here? Uh, I like the next uh, slide particularly because it shows you that, uh, first of all, Germany seems to be a powerhouse in terms of R&D expenditure and in what uh, terms of, of R&D we are doing. And you really get an impression uh, how much we spend on R&D, whether this is overinvestment and so on, we, we might discuss later on. But anyway, I, I consider it interesting. Uh, so I uh, try to enlarge this at the moment. Oh. And it worked. And what you see here is that Bavaria spends as much, these are data from 2010, as Russia, Baden-Württemberg alone, spends as much in terms of R&D as Spain and Portugal. 
okay, uh, the small Saarland spends as much as, as, a, as the Slovak Republic has as much as Finland, which was pretty much uh, Nokia. Berlin spends as much as Turkey, okay? So, and North Rhine-Westphalia spends as much as Netherlands, which is really comparable. Uh, and you see here that Germany really uh, spends a lot on R&D and outspends many other countries, in a sense. And uh, what, uh, this is another uh, take on, on R&D, uh, which is, I think, rather interesting. This goes back to uh, a study by the DEV, the German Institute of Economic Research, and they look into R&D expenditure and they see that Germany spends really a lot on R&D. Okay? Uh, it has a high share uh, in terms of value added or it has a high share of research intensive industries. 12% uh, of all industries are research intensive. What is research intensive? It has uh, a research intensity between 2.5 and 7% uh, of the turnover. Okay. Uh, and however, most of these industries are high tech industries, but not cutting edge technology. Cutting edge would be, and now I have to erase that, uh, uh, industries which really spend very much on, on R&D, namely more than 7%. And what you see here is that the US somehow is the country which is best in, in cutting edge technology. They have the highest share in, in terms of these cutting edge technology. So that's perhaps no, no coincidence that the GAFAs, the Googles, the Apples, the Facebooks, the Amazons are from the US. Yeah, uh, that should look different. Oh no. Uh, here is you, here what you see here is uh, the 15 top industrial sectors by overall R&D intensity. So you might ask which sectors of the industry spend most on R&D, which are the most R&D prone sectors. And as I told you already, pharmaceuticals and biotechnology, uh, as well as uh, computer services, they spend most. They have a share of 14%. Remember that the average share in our economy or average R&D spending was below or about 3%. Okay. Uh, so this is really a high-tech sector in terms of R&D intensity. Uh, it's also technology and hardware, aerospace, automobiles also spend a lot, whereas uh, construction uh, only spends a little on, on R&D, even though it's among the top 50. Okay? And there is not much difference uh, between the EU, uh, the US, and Japan in, in this uh, respect. So uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why we typically have these case studies on the pharmaceutical sector, because this pharmaceutical or development of medical drugs and also of, of some medical equipment is rather research intensive and, and R&D is very important uh, in, that, in that sector. Why do firms invest in R&D? Because it pays off. Here you see uh, uh, different estimates of the estimated rate of return on an investment in R&D. And here you see numbers uh, uh, about which uh, two things are probably interesting. First of all, there's typically a rather wide range from 15 to 28 percent. But if you remember what the rate of return is, if you put your money uh, in a savings account, it's pretty much zero or even negative. And here you see figures of, say, 25 and more percent. OK, so uh, uh, here in the notes, I also have a quote by 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 uh, Jacques Mares and, and Pierre Monen uh, in the handbook article from, from Brown Bean Hall and Nathan Rosenberg. And uh, they state that in general, the private returns to R&D are strongly positive and somewhat higher than those for ordinary capital. The important thing is that uh, while uh, uh, these private returns are positive, I have mentioned the, prop or the, the point of spillovers. Okay, other companies typically le learn from, from uh, what, what innovators do. If Apple uh, gets a notch on their smartphone, other companies imitate. If they get some new device, other companies imitate and also uh, gain, uh, uh, gain from this innovation. And therefore, the social returns are typically much higher. That is, to society at, as whole, uh, these, these, uh, these uh, returns are much higher. Okay, uh, Even though you might debate how sensible estimates between 11 and 111 uh, percent are, what you see is that re social returns are much higher. And that led, uh, or that led to the conclusion, a uh, rather famous paper by Chad Jones and oh, whatever the first name of Williams is uh, in the quarterly journal of economics in 1998, is that conservative estimates suggest that optimal R&D investment is at least two to four times actual investment. That is, the point here is social returns are so much higher than private returns that you get typically insufficient incentive to invest in R&D. So if you're working in, a, in the R&D department of Siemens, this is a good argument to go to the government and say, we need subsidies because we, have, we provide so, much spill, so many spillovers and so on, so that you really should uh, fund us uh, government because otherwise we get insufficient investment in, in R&D. 
importance of R&D. I already told you that, of course, here we only, uh, in the beginning, uh, you already saw these uh, social returns, but in the beginning we were only looking at an output measure, okay, the 3% measure. Of course, uh, this is only one measure. Uh, oh, excuse me, it's not an output, it's an input measure, of course, because that's how much you spend. Output would be, for instance, uh, uh, would be, for instance, the number of patents you generate with this expenditure. So it's an input measure, uh, which could easily be inflated if you say, okay, uh, we just uh, pay every researcher twice uh, his current salary, then you would have a huge increase in R&D expenditure without probably getting a huge uh, increase in, in say, uh, technical progress. So it's only, uh, only an input measure, but nevertheless, uh, the question is how important it is, and that's what we turn to right now. Remember the correlation and the discussion I had about correlation versus causality. So total factor productivity. That's in a sense what drives uh, what drives uh, per capita growth, okay? Because total factor productivity means if we abstract from increases in, in capital and increases in labor force and increases in human capital, uh, what is the increase, what percentage of GDP growth is due to technological uh, progress? Uh, and these are very different results, which range from 0.1 to 0.9, and these uh, sound like very small numbers, but that would mean that it makes up to 50% of the increase in output per worker. And this is due to technical uh, or technological progress, okay? Uh, these are typically from growth accounting studies, uh, these results, and I have some lengthy quote uh, in, in the notes here, but the important point is that R&D is important for total factor productivity and total factor productivity uh, then increases the output per worker, uh, makes it possible to pay higher wages and therefore to get higher per capita income. Uh, and uh, that's now uh, from an OECD study where they try to come up uh, whether this is just a correlation uh, or is uh, between R&D expenditure and GDP and they at least have some indication that is at least some causal uh, evidence or uh, some causality here, meaning that R&D expenditure, excuse me, uh, I have to st start in the very beginning, countries where R&D expenditure in the business sector in relation to, to GDP has increased most from the 80s to the 90s, typically have experienced the largest increase in growth of multi-factor productivity. Okay, so R&D expenditure seems to be important. Oh, I think you have deserved a small uh, short break and I just will ask for questions here because it's really quite some speed. This importance has also been accounted for uh, by politicians. There have been two famous summits. The first one was the Lisbon summit. Uh, I don't know in... in, in, in uh, in hindsight, you might uh, consider this as a, as a tremendous failure uh, because at this uh, summit, I think uh, German Chancellor was, was Gerhard Schröder at that time, uh, the, the political goal was to transform the European Union by 2010 into the most competitive and dynamic knowledge-based economy in the world capable of sustainable economic growth with more and better jobs and greater social cohesion. Uh, you all know what 2009 happened. 2010, we were in the midst uh, of, of the financial crisis and 2012, we had the Euro crisis. Okay, so obviously we didn't uh, really uh, deliver on this uh, promise. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, this is not a part to discuss that in more detail. We are uh, interested here in what happens in terms of R&D. How did they want to achieve this goal? Now, in particular, uh, they, they specified that at the European Council in Barcelona in March 2002, uh, that they want to reach it by increasing the level of expenditure in uh, research and development and they wanted to expand it to 3%. You see, 3% uh, uh, seems to be a magical number in, in European institutions. We have the Maastricht criteria stating that a budget deficit must not be higher than 3%. Uh, European countries didn't deliver on that. Uh, they, they had more uh, budget, higher budget deficit than a 3% in terms of GDP or of R&D expenditure. Uh, unfortunately, it was lower. But you saw, for instance, Austria really uh, reached that goal. I don't know, by 2016 and 17, I might get back to that. And uh, Germany uh, also reaches it. But of course, uh, this was uh, about the average of the EU, and uh, we are much lower currently. OK? So politics, at least you see the importance of these 3% uh, and of this input measure. OK, now, uh, if there are no questions by now. I would move on to definitions and, and concepts. I haven't seen any, any, any comment apart from one uh, which asks details about uh, 
the 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 uh, the, the points for the assignments. I guess uh, it's best to ask that then once again uh, in uh, in in the tutorial class. Uh, you get yeah here the question is whether you get five percent for these case studies, five percent for participation, and ten percent for assignments. Uh, that's not quite true because participation means contribution. Okay, just uh, contribution. That is, you present some uh, uh, some problem on the on the, on a virtual whiteboard. Okay, that was something uh, just to to uh, comment on on that uh, remark. This is on the chat. Has been on a pin one. There was another question in the chat about the assignments. We will at the end of the the lecture in the Webex chat have the chance to discuss that uh, further on. Okay. So we will discuss how the assignments work uh, in more detail afterwards in Webex. Chat. Yeah, I just move on. Uh, you see, I like to talk so much about economics of innovation. I could stop talk without uh, uh, any stops here. Hopefully, uh, you can follow my my talk. Uh, I, here, I just want to give you. Uh, 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 a definition, you should have some idea of what a process innovation is and what a product innovation is. A process innovation is just an innovation or an activity uh, which aims at cheaper production of known products. So if you introduce some robots uh, and this in decreases your, your, your production costs, this would be a process innovation. A production of new products, the next generation of the iPhone would be a product innovation. You also might have an improvement of uh, the organization like, for instance, you introduce just-in-time production, you introduce lean management, and so on, or certain new, uh, new uh, production principles or organizational principles. Uh, what I already have shown you to a large degree were the different stages of research. We started with basic research, then we might come uh, to the invention, innovation, and imitation diffusion. It's, it's not so easy to distinguish these, uh, these things. Uh, here, I, I just provide you uh, the, the definition of uh, Freeman Sutter. Uh, invention is an idea, sketch, or a model for a new and, uh, or improved device, product, product, process, or system. It may be patented in the majority of cases. Is not the important difference with the innovation is that that the innovation in the economic sense is only accomplished uh, with the first commercial transaction. So there must be some commercial value involving this new product or with the process uh, innovation, the process system or device. Okay, even though the, the word is also used to describe uh, the whole process. Okay, uh, here you saw where, or you see that I use uh, really uh, many data about Austria because I first gave this course in Austria and because Austria is also interesting because we have these uh, increase, these dynamics in terms of R and D uh, activity. Uh, the European Commission has each, or oh, I don't know, every three or five years. Uh, a so-called community innovation service. Here are some survey uh, where uh, in uh, probably in 28 countries of the European Unis, Union, uh, businesses are surveyed and asked about their R&D activities. Of course, the problems are as always with surveys, uh, do, do uh, companies tell the truth and so on, but here, why should they not so? And we have a lot of, of uh, experience. I don't know at, at which, uh, uh, around we are currently, but anyway. Uh, so here the point is that uh, every second enterprise in the US, uh, in, in, in Austria, claimed to be innovating. So 49% of Austrian enterprises with more than nine employees were innovating. This percentage was higher in the manufacturing sector than in the service sector. You might imagine that, that the manufacturing sector, think of uh, automotive production and so on, uh, is, is slightly, uh, slightly more innovative or research intensive than uh, the service sector. And here, our previous discussion, whether it's the large companies or the small companies, you see 89% of large size enterprises carried out innovation activities for the small companies. This figure was only 42%. Uh, the problem, of course, is here, what is innovation? If the owner of such a small company is an engineer and uh, does some thinking uh, on Sunday afternoon about some project, of course, it's not a formal innovation activity, but we pretty much just the same as someone uh, sitting in a research department of Siemens and thinking about the next product. Okay, so here you see the problems uh, with really capturing uh, what innovation innovation activities are. But nevertheless, what you see is that uh, the share is much higher for formal innovative activities in large companies than it is in in, in smaller companies. Uh, so here, what 
kind of uh, innovation do you get? And 35% of enterprises uh, uh, introduce product innovations and 14 market novelties. So a product innovation, or I start with market novelties first, the iPhone at least was a market novelty in 2007. Uh, product innovation, if when, when Samsung also brought out the smart or, or brought to the market a smartphone, it was certainly a product innovation for, for, for Samsung, but it was not really a market novelty. At least to a certain degree, you might uh, discuss that. Okay, uh, but anyway, uh, the the first uh, guy in town was was Apple. Then, uh, what you see, 25% uh, of enterprises do uh, invest in process innovations, and product innovations account for a, a important part or uh, share of, of total sales, 13%. And market novelties also make up 5%. And quality improvements, which you might call incremental or small innovations, we will discuss uh, this this point uh, later on in our theoretical uh, models, uh, are the most important innovation. This is what most countries, uh, most uh, most uh, uh, companies do. Uh, and uh, finally, R&D cooperation. We will have uh, uh, a, top, a chapter on research joint ventures on R&D cooperation. And you see R&D cooperation is important. Remember, I talked of spillovers. Very often you have spillovers. And if you're from the same industry, it might might make sense uh, to cooperate. Right now we have seen many cooperations uh, to 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 tackle the problems related to COVID-19, for instance. Okay, so here 20% of all innovating uh, enterprises cooperate somehow. Uh, and uh, now the question why uh, so, so many, so 50% of the firms do not innovate. Uh, they stated that, uh, or 29% uh, stated that uh, the costs are too high for innovation. Probably the cost for researchers are too high and so on. So they, they don't do it. And 60% of the non-innovating enterprises did not carry out innovation because they said there was no need for such work due to market conditions. Hopefully uh, they don't learn it the hard way and, and, don't, go, and don't go bankrupt because they didn't uh, innovate. Okay, but uh, that's it uh, for the moment. Yeah, you see I'm still moving on. Uh, we are almost done with, with, with the lecture here. Uh, here, uh, uh, just very briefly on the characteristics of R&D. Uh, R&D is very complicated. Typically, uh, R&D or the research development process is uncertain, meaning that you neither know how long it will take until you have you are successful. That's uh, the the really problematic question we have right now with with the the COVID-19 uh, vaccines. We don't know how long it will take until we get a vaccine. Okay. Uh, we also very often do not know if we invest in R&D what the size, what the inventive step of our innovation uh, will be. So, so how much better is a new product? How much better is the iPhone or the next generation of the iPhone as a new phone? And then we also do not know which approach works. Uh, also in COVID-19, there are several approaches. Currently, they try uh, several kinds of, of medical drugs to treat the, the, these, these, uh, these illness, but it, you don't know which approach works. Uh, we will talk later on the different uh, externalities related uh, uh, with, with R&D expenditures and R&D activities. I already mentioned you mentioned the spillovers, which is related to profit stealing, uh, meaning that, of course, if you see that uh, Apple has a very nice feature in their phone, you just might to imitate and uh, sell it at a cheaper price without incurring uh, the development costs. So that would be profit stealing. Consumers typically uh, gain from, from R&D uh, because you get product innovations and uh, firms typically can not uh, 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 appropriate all consumer surplus. We will discuss that in length uh, in the theoretical models. Uh, now, the time structure, both of the models we look into as well as the R&D process is different. So you might have R&D races. We will discuss that in the, in, 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 in the question of, of, of uh, patent races. And you will have multi-stage projects like in, for, in medical drugs. Uh, and typically, you have imperfect competition. We get back to that. Uh, Okay, uh, just to give you some uh, some example how important uncertainty is in the R&D project. Uh, there was a, a, a Austrian uh, biotechnology startup uh, where I used to know the founder of this company called Intercell. And this is a, a slide from or, or, a, or a table from 2004. And at that time, they planned to go into phase three uh, with the, their drug uh, against Japanese encephalitis and, and thought they have finished the product by 2006 and have a, a, a product against a hepatitis uh, C in 2011. Uh, and what you see here is, on the next slide, this is a product pipeline from 2013. And you see uh, hepatitis uh, C is no longer here. Obviously, it, it failed. Uh, and Gilead had, a, had another, uh, 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 probably won the patent race with a, with a new product called Sophos Bovir. Uh, and you see Japanese encephalitis, 
uh, who was which was supposed to be finished or filed for uh, at a at the B at the B farm at the pharmaceutical uh, regulator in 2006 was only phase three in in 2013, and they still didn't have a product finished. Okay, so you see here they spent uh, I don't know at least dozens of millions and were not yet successful. So because it's it's highly uh, highly uncertain uh, research pro uh, pro. Uh, uh, Process and that's what you also see here uh, from a paper by Stevens and Burley. Uh, you actually start up with 3,000 draw ideas. You uh, you pursue 300 ideas. You start 125 small projects, which lead into nine early stage uh, development uh, projects, and then you get for major development, you get 1.7 launches, and you get only one success. Okay, that's uh, the new business development effort, and you see uh, this is just. Uh, highlights the, the, the uncertainty uh, related to R&D and that uh, also you will see matters a lot uh, or, or has a large influence on why medical drugs are so expensive because it's so likely that uh, you have failures. Yeah, uh, we will discuss this, this slide in more detail in, in the, in the, in the uh, case study course. Uh, and I will talk more about the importance of intellectual property rights in our topic on patents. Uh, companies earn a lot with uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, and here, just to give you an overview of R&D spending by firms, in 2014, it was Volkswagen spending the most uh, today. And uh, just look at this table. You will see German companies are spending a lot. Google is also spending a lot. And uh, they are called now Alphabet and now lead the pack in terms of R&D expenditures. Uh, they have a rather high R&T expenditure uh, or, or, or intensity Volkswagen, but companies like Intel have a much higher one, as you see here. Uh, what you don't see here is Apple, but Apple uh, changed a lot. You will see that on the on the next slide. They invested a lot. Uh, here you get uh, the, uh, oh, I just jumped to that for, for a second, where you can get all these nice uh, data. If I find it, there is a wonderful, there is a wonderful, uh, page by the European Commission, where you see the EU Industrial R&D Investments Core Board. And here you see the company with the world rank one, which is Alphabet, which is the, 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 the parent company of Google, spends most. Uh, Volkswagen now is third on the world rank, Apple is six, and so on. So just visit that, uh, visit that and you'll see uh, how nicely they uh, present that. And here you see also what, what we previously had. The pharmaceutical sector is important in Europe. Uh, it's also important, uh, the automotive sector, technology, and hardware. Okay, uh, that's what you see here. And actually, overview of the course, I think that's what I'm going to give you uh, next week. You will see we treat, uh, uh, or not next week, not next week, but on Thursday, uh, we will start with models of imperfect competition. Then we'll look into what is called the arrow model. Uh, we'll then look into a model that's Gupta Stieglitz, which is better, for instance, to model what happens in the automotive industry. Look then into patents and patent policy, look into licensing, uh, patent races I covered already, adoption and diffusion, where we will have really the epidemic uh, curves you see now in our COVID-19 epidemic, uh, research joint ventures, network industry innovations, and so on. And finally, uh, the seminar. So, and that's already the beginning of the next uh, uh, chapter of the next lecture. Uh, so at th this point, I want to finish uh, my presentation. I thank you for, for watching it and uh, hopefully I meet you again on Thursday. Bye. Okay, that was it. Uh, so, Hopefully you understood most of uh, the topics and uh, I'm available now for questions and uh, we can discuss all the questions you might have on, on the assignments and so on. And uh, yeah, see you. Thank you. Bye.